It's a rivalry renewed in Lincoln between the Huskers and the Sooners. Brian Christofferson from Husker 24-7 and Parker Thune from OU Insider joining me now to break it all down. And Brian, I'll start with you because we got to get to the headline of the week. Scott Frost being fired, obviously overshadowing this game. How's the program handling things behind the scenes and how can these players and coaches salvage the season despite all the distractions? Well, it all falls on Mickey Joseph. He's a new interim coach, and uh, he's trying to get a pep in the guy's step. Um, I think I think players honestly sort of saw this coming after Saturday night when you lose 45-42 to 42 to Georgia Southern and give up 642 yards of offense at a, at a big-time school. You know uh, something's probably coming down the pike, especially when the coach uh, was 16-31, and 31, as Scott Frost was. Um, you know, it's been played out a lot, but his stats in uh, one score games, he was five and 22. So um, often close was Nebraska under Scott Frost, but they didn't have the answers. And it was sort of like whack-a-mole. A different thing popped up every week and, and uh, got in the way. So I think they felt a new voice was in order. And uh, they're hoping that Mickey Joseph sort of gives them a spark here. You know, Nebraska spent the turn of the century going through an identity crisis. It really hasn't had one since the big red machine and Tom Osborne. Brian, the coaching search just starting, but what have discussions in Lincoln been like and what's the outlook for this program moving forward? Well, there's, of course, right now there's names that are all over the place, but I really think they need to find a guy with a head coaching background who has a track record of success in the trenches. You know, his teams that you are known for disciplined football and winning up front. I think that's what you got to have in the Big Ten. Um, I still think it's an attractive job and there's going to be some some coaches around the country look at it and say, hey, they got resources, they got fan support, they got a lot of NIL money. I can probably get a lot done there. Um, there's obviously a lot of coaches, that, you know, they have egos. They think they, they can be the guy who, who changes things. Um, so I think it's going to be they're going to have a lot of people that are interested. Uh, but I, I think they, they got to make sure they hire the right fit and not necessarily just the guy who looks good on press conference day. Um, I don't think they need to they should worry about that. It's got to be a guy they feel good like three years from now that he's he's got his team playing some disciplined football. Yeah, win the hire, not the press conference. All right, exactly. so one guy's out. The other just got in. Brent Venables off to a 2-0 start with Oklahoma. I thought this was really cool. He said the first game he ever went to as a 16-year-old kid was a Nebraska-Oklahoma game. So you have to imagine this is a pretty cool experience for him. Parker, let's get you in here now. How do you view the start of the Venables era? Yeah, Grace, it's exciting. It is, but in all transparency, we still know very little about this team and about this on-field product in this 2022 season. How much do wins over UTEP and Kent State really tell us about what kind of team Oklahoma can be? They face their true, their first true litmus test this weekend as they go up to Lincoln. And Brent Venables has said all the right things. He's instilled his culture. They're recruiting exceptionally well. He's got the entire fan base behind him. But this is road test number one. It's uncharted territory against a team that they should beat on paper, sure, but will no doubt have a little extra fire under their bellies Saturday. So the spotlight is certainly on Brent Venables, uh, not just from the Oklahoma contingent uh, this weekend, but around the nation. There'll be a lot of folks that pay attention to what this Oklahoma team does in a hostile road environment up in Lincoln. Yeah, can you show out on a big stage? Back to the Huskers side, Mickey Joseph up for the task as the interim head coach, as Brian, you mentioned. Now, he comes from a family of coaches, so he knows how it's done, and he's already mixing things up with staff promotions and practice schedule changes. So, Brian, how is he approaching this game? Yeah, he, he's made a couple minor changes. He had to elevate one guy to fill an opening that, that's obviously he was there when, when Frost left. And and he, actually, he's moving his defensive coordinator to also work with the safety. So Eric Janander is going to do double duty um, there. But I think the biggest thing he's trying to do is just feed his guys confidence. He talked about that multiple times at this week's press conference is, you know, you've got a team that frankly doesn't hasn't been getting blown out when it loses it's right there to win games but there's not a lot of belief sometimes when there's five minutes left that they're going to close the deal they're executing very well on offense the big question is can they figure out the defense the tackling's been atrocious they've just uh they're not getting really any pass rush um and last week georgia southern did whatever they wanted to and then of course oklahoma's going to have athletes all over the place so can Nebraska's defense play at least adequately in space? Um, that's a big 
big ask, and it's not really Mickey's side of the ball either. So, I mean, that, that's where it's a difficult challenge. Yeah, you're now at the point you're kind of testing out what fits and what needs to go in the next era. But this feels like a morale game for a lot of people here. It's been a season-long lull for Nebraska, obviously. But, you know, Oklahoma's had some lulls of its own, a slow start last week against Kent State. What's the key to a win for each side? Parker, we'll start with you. Yeah, Grace, to me, it's really simple. You can't let Nebraska seize early momentum and you can't let them dictate the pace of the game, right? The most basic recipe for the slaying of a giant, as it were, for victory over a team that is ostensibly more talented than you is you got to slow the game down. Look no further than Marshall over Notre Dame a week ago. Appalachian State with a big victory over Texas A&M at Kyle Field. Nebraska themselves employed that very strategy last year in Norman, and they came very close to pulling off an upset on the road. Now, you look at what Oklahoma did on Saturday, or rather didn't do. They went scoreless for the first 29 minutes and change against Kent State, and granted, that was all but forgotten when they heated up in the second half and route to a 33-3 victory. But while you can get away with some early doldrums against a team like Kent State, you may not be able to get away with it in a raucous road environment against what will be an inspired opponent on Saturday. So they're going to have to cut, come out of the gate strong and put points on the board early to really solidify themselves uh, and establish the upper hand in this contest. And Brian, your key to a victory here. Yeah, you know, there's going to be that play early in the game where the defense maybe has a chance on a third and six or something like that to get off the field and they got to make it. I mentioned the bad tackling before they've got to on that in that circumstance, keep, keep Oklahoma short of the sticks, get a confidence boost for their defense. And then Casey Thompson has actually been playing at a pretty high level since joining the program. There's been not a lot wrong with him played a great game last Saturday. He's going to have to have, uh, he's just going to have to ball out. I mean, he's going to he played really well uh, against Oklahoma when he was at Texas a year ago. Uh, Nebraska does have some good skill weapons and Anthony Grant's kind of an exciting running back. Um, so that offense, I think, you, you know, they need a they need a score early and boost the morale and get guys thinking after the first quarter. Hey, we can play with these guys. This could be a four quarter game. All right. Well, this home and home series has been fun. But you know what we all want? You know, what we all need is Nebraska-Oklahoma every year, just like the glory days, just like the old Big 12 rivalry days. These two don't play again until 2029 and 2030. That's absurd. Parker, you were born and raised in Lincoln, so I imagine you know a little bit about this rivalry. What's it mean to see these two teams playing again? Well, actually born and raised in Omaha, so about 45 minutes up the road. But uh, yes, a Nebraskan through and through, and just on a personal note, as somebody that grew up in the state and now covers the Sooners, I mean, this is bucket list material. This is my world's colliding. But regardless of your individual perspective, there's no denying that this is one of the most historically significant rivalries in college football. As you kind of mentioned there as well, Grace, there was a time where OU and Nebraska were the two biggest football brands in America. This was a top 10 matchup every year, if not a top five matchup. And there were always national title implications when these two teams squared off. Now, they haven't met in Lincoln since 2009. Some of the guys that will take the field on Saturday couldn't even read yet when that matchup occurred. So I know it's not especially feasible for non-conference opponents on an annual basis to renew rivalry series like this one. But we have to get these games on the schedule as often as possible because it's just good for college football. Yeah, I mean, there there's certain games when you see the two helmets together, uh, it just it gets people fired up that have watched college football their whole life, and this would be one of those. So just seeing those uniforms on the field, the, hearing those fight songs, it's a special thing. I think in Nebraska, and Parker knows this, I, fi I feel like it's been a respectful rivalry uh, back back in the day. I mean, there certainly uh, there was some animosity back in the 80s between, you know, what maybe Nebraska fans thought of Barry Switzer or something like that. But as, as the two parted ways, I think there's sort of been that want to, man, I wish those guys could play more. Of course, Nebraska needs to get up to the level uh, that Oklahoma's at right now to make that more interesting if they do play more. Um, so that'll be the task for them. But um, I love these games. I, I love when uh, college football gives us these games in non-conference. And uh, as Parker said, we need more of them. And, um, you know, you never know in a game like this. A year ago, uh, I think a lot of people thought it was going to be one of those deals where Nebraska gets its uh, doors blown off and ended up being a seven point game. So sometimes when, when teams like this come together, it ends up being a, a little bit something more special than you think it might be.
based off the the the, uh, the predictions going in. Yeah, rivalries like this, it keeps the heart of college football pumping. All right, Brian and Parker, thanks so much for your insight. Enjoy your game day over there. And remember, head over to Husker247.com and OUinsider.com for more on this game.